the problem is created by the very wide usage of the term libertarian. Uh, you can draw its uh, lineage back to the year of the French Revolution and uh, there was a journal that used to come which is called uh, that particular journal was called La Libertaire uh, Le Journal du Mouvement Social um, so translated into English it means uh, the libertarian um, which is a journal of uh, social movements that is how it uh, basically will get translated and in 1789 funnily enough the, it was an Englishman who published an article on libertarianism as such um, this uh, Englishman went by the name of William Belcham um, This was in 1789 the year of the French Revolution. And at that time, libertarianism was associated with uh, anarchism and uh, with left-wing socialism, including Marxism, okay? Um, but the ideas of libertarianism were actually appropriated in the 1870s in America by a uh, thinker who went with the name Benjamin Tucker. This happened in the 1870s and he created He created a right-wing uh, libertarianism. Uh, but libertarianism's definitive tilt, or rather not tilt, what should I say? It's incorporation into the liberal tradition okay into the liberal tradition happened with uh, this particular person 
Murray Rothbard And uh, Murray Rothbard is also an American. But the person uh, who became a definitive uh, libertarian, uh, which was an extreme form of uh, libertarianism, uh, liberalism, sorry, uh, happened to be um, Okay. Now, Robert Nozick, uh, please understand, critiqued the liberalism of John Rawls. So here is my problem. Because the definitive form of liberalism, uh, sorry, libertarianism, comes mainly from Robert Nozick and to a very limited extent, even from another person uh, shall I put his name here yeah Frederick I'm using the spelling that he used. Some people write CK. He was actually Friedrich uh, von Hayek. But let's just call him Frederick Hayek. An economist, also a classical liberal uh, thinker, but he also tended to lean towards uh, libertarianism. Um, and uh, this again happened in 1970, the year that uh, uh, Rawls published his definitive work a theory of justice uh, and Frederick Hayek funnily uh, not funnily interestingly won the Nobel Prize for economics 
where he advocated libertarian economics, which is basically something uh, like, you know, extreme individualism, extreme individual freedom. And uh, he, it's a, it's a landmark uh, thing that happened. The sharing of this uh, Nobel Prize for economics. Uh, incidentally, it is actually not called the Nobel Prize. I have uh, forgotten what exactly it is called due to disuse. It is called something else, but it is, uh, what do we say? It is considered to be the equivalent of a Nobel Prize. So he won this prize or he shared it with Gunnar Mardol, G-U-N-N-A-R, Gunnar, uh, M-Y-R-D-A-L, Mardol. And uh, the reason why I say this is very interesting is because of the fact that Gunnar Mardol was a leftist, socialist kind of a thinker. Uh, he had written this book called The Asian Drama. And uh, he basically believed that uh, China and India uh, will, will suffer in the coming years, that is from 1970, due to the excessive population that they were having. Okay, so his uh, theory was based on populations, uh, both in China and in India. And since I brought that up, let me just mention this point in passing, at least today, which is that he was proved to be completely, completely wrong, totally wrong. Okay, if you actually look at what happened, both with China and with India, you will see that we have a thing called the demographic dividend. Okay, uh, now China doesn't have the demographic, let me put that here. demographic dividend, uh, which is not there right now so much in favor of China, but it is there in favor of India. And some of the economists, including uh, what Banerjee is he? Uh, he also won that uh, Nobel Prize. Um, I'm not able to remember. It comes, his name starts with A. He's some A Banerjee. Um, he and uh, quite a few economists argue that we have a demand, uh, we enjoy a Abhijit Banerjee. Abhijit Banerjee, thank you very much, uh, uh, Akshay. Uh, so Abhijit Banerjee 
uh, and some other economists, they basically claim that we will enjoy this demographic dividend till the 19, sorry, till the 2040s, after which we might uh, not have this. So what exactly is this demogra demographic dividend? Okay, the demographic dividend that economist, economists speak about is having a young and productive population the younger the population the more productive they are now china had this advantage it had it over us till about a decade ago but china doesn't have this anymore okay it uh, because they went in for uh, severe measures of population control and in doing so uh, they've lost the advantage that they had uh, over us uh, over india and now it is uh, india which has the demographic dividend uh, does anyone know what is the average age of an Indian? Anyone? 66 years. No, no, that is a lifespan. What you are giving is the lifespan. The average lifespan of an Indian is 66 years. Yes. But what is the average uh, age of the Indians, which is the, the average age is the bracket into which most number of people fall? 25 or something like that. Yes, you're, you're right, you're right. Yeah. It's somewhere, it was hovering between 24 and 25, 24 and 26. But it is very much in the middle 20s. So Abhijit Banerjee and uh, his wife, uh, I've forgotten her name completely. Esther Duflo. Yeah, Esther Deslo, correct. Um, Esther Deslo, she actually is supposed to have done most of the work. Um, and people say Abhijit Banerjee just rode on her uh, shoulders and got himself this Nobel Prize, uh, very much like what Amartya Sen did. But anyway, let's not go into those dirty politics and conspiracy theories. Uh, so since we have a population whose age is 25, 26, or somewhere around there, we are supposed to have this demographic dividend, which will make us achieve multi-sectoral economic growth. Okay, so it went completely contrary to Gunnar Murdahl's idea that our population will become our liability in economic terms all right in economic terms and uh, the fact that indians uh, we have a i think we have a very biased uh, and negative view about ourselves Actually, if you look at us, we have a tendency to uh, uh, concentrate upon the negative things that are there in us. Uh, and I'm not talking about the COVID thing that is doing there on that. I don't agree. 
that we are concentrating on the negatives of how many died, how the state failed. We should look at how many. No, that is a failure of the state. That is a different issue. But in general, we tend, we tend not to look at some of the very, very positive things that our country has. The first thing is, despite, despite this huge second wave of COVID in which amidst which we are now, uh, the prediction of international agencies such as uh, SNP and uh, which is standard in poor and uh, also predictions of uh, uh, what is that other Fitch, Fitch Modi mm -hmm. Fitch Modi yeah Fitch Modi uh, all of them are pegging uh, the growth to be over 9% annually, okay? Uh, while China is nowhere near us in terms of its growth. All right, uh, in, in terms of our post-pandemic growth. Uh, so there are some good things. Uh, which is, it seems to be that we have a, a resilient population. Moody's is another, uh, that, that is, yeah. Uh, so if you're looking at all these uh, things, we have this demographic dividend, which Abhijit Banerjee says we'll, we will not have due to following measures of population control. But if you, this pandemic is probably going to turn his theory upside down. Okay, uh, because uh, the loss of population uh, is not in the younger group, though this time around, the loss of population, there are more and more people in the younger group this time, but the losses are not so severe that it becomes, that it becomes, uh, what should I say? Um, it is not so severe that it will change the demographic dividend. And since the deaths are higher in uh, age, uh, that only increases the demographic dividend of the country, which probably will mean that India will continue to enjoy the demographic dividend beyond beyond 2040 as well. We have to wait and see, but the pandemic is definitely going to upset the figures that have been put forward by economists like uh, Abhijit Banerjee uh, and his wife, Esther Deslo. So um, we'll have to wait and see. But right now, the economy is probably one of the, if not the fastest, definitely one of the fastest. Uh, Japan is going to slow down because of complete loss of a younger population. Their average age is 80 and people live there till 130. Um, but they are still able to produce because they are dependent uh, more on machines than they are on people. So, um, 
let's see how this plays out anyway. So the demographic dividend is having a young and productive population. Okay, the, uh, it's a very watered down way of putting it. There are many things that you need to stitch into that thing to get a proper picture. Uh, but anyway, let's return to this thing about uh, liberal, libertarianism. Now, the problem with libertarianism is that, uh, like I said, it started as a left-wing thing. It was called anarcho-libertarianism. Anarchists, actually, or it should be pronounced anarchists, they were the ones who originally advocated libertarianism. Okay, and uh, it did have a social component to it. Uh, it talked about the individual, the anarcho or the left wing liberalism. It talked about the uh, individual, but not as individualism but they said they, there should be a little bit of individual autonomy. Okay, so that the individual can be a self-determining individual, which is their uh, disagreement uh, with, uh, it is their uh, d disagreement with Marxism. Okay, so, but like I said, from the 1870 or 70s onwards, starting with uh, Benjamin Tucker, right wing libertarianism, it's a very funny thing now because uh, the, we, we normally uh, associate the right wing with the establishment and with the with the conservatism okay we establish it with conservatives okay those who harp on uh, traditions and things like that okay uh, but funnily enough to distinguish his form of libertarianism, his form of individualism, he had to use this term right-wing libertarianism because in America, well, uh, that was the establishment. Liberalism was the establishment. Uh, so therefore, to incorporate into American mainstream philosophical beliefs, uh, he had to use this right-wing libertarianism term. A very, very misleading and uh, confusing term. So probably it's Murray Rothbard who should be credited. But like I said, I don't want to talk about libertarianism. I've talked about it a bit anyway, because it does say libertarianism on top of your uh, syllabus. So I've given you a broad picture of uh, what libertarianism can look like, or let me put it this way, will look like when I start talking to you about uh, uh, libertarianism in some detail. Uh, and let me also tell you that I will ignore uh, most of 
left wing libertarianism because we'll just go through it as a we'll just flip through it because it today has no consequences it has no consequences of any kind to anyone so to talk about that right now is not necessary but we'll acknowledge it we'll acknowledge that it once existed and we'll also try and identify one or two very important uh, traits of left wing libertarianism then we'll go into the rest of it uh till we get into uh a understanding of uh, a little bit of understanding of head frederick hayek i'd like to do that because let me see if we have the time for that uh hayek uh, wrote a set of uh, essays which he very unimaginatively called new essays god knows for what reason he called it uh, new essays uh and in that he shows his libertarian leanings otherwise most of the time he would fit into the mold of classical liberalism okay so uh I'll see if we need to do something about him. Let me take a call on that later. But we have to do Robert Nozick, most definitely, because today, whatever libertarianism that most people know is what uh, Robert Nozick talked about. Okay, and... Uh, therefore i will now shift back to classical liberalism and uh, by shifting to classical liberalism i'll finish off what we had started yesterday and uh, we will try and understand what were the reasons behind classical liberalism taking on the contours that it took and uh, we will then contrast uh, rawlsian liberalism with that of uh, the liberalism of the classical variety i will talk about neo liberalism not in this paper we do have to talk about neo liberalism uh, because it is something that is there today though i am not a very big fan of uh, that coinage of neo liberalism because if you rehash liberalism it doesn't become new okay if you put old wine in a new bottle the wine doesn't become new right so neo liberalism is nothing but a resurgence of liberalism just a resurgence of liberalism in the aftermath of the destruction of the soviet union and the near disappearance the near disappearance of the whole idea 
and philosophy of communism from the world. China says it is communist. It's not communist. What China is has to be understood as state monopoly capitalism. Okay, state monopoly capitalism. So it's not communist. That is supposed to be the only country that still calls itself communist. But they are so capitalist that they are the creators of these special economic zones. They are the creators of these special economic zones, an idea that we have copied from them. And this is all a part of what people call neoliberalism. And to me, I don't see so much of a distinction between liberalism of then and liberalism of now uh, that we talk about neoliberalism, except for the fact that uh, there is this particular theory that starting with the 1990s, when uh, countries like India, which were otherwise protecting economies or protective economies, they moved on to become uh, the, a part of the global economy and they have actually taken on, uh, they have actually taken on uh, the program of structural adjustment and uh, all those things. So what you have to understand is that uh, we'll just see why people call it neoliberalism, though I don't subscribe to that particular idea very much. Let's get back to classical liberalism. Not going to dig deep into this because we will be doing it in the other paper. Well, while talking about classical liberalism, let me first tell you that classical liberalism is an amoral system of thought and society. <clears throat> it is amoral in the sense that it is not something that is immoral. It doesn't break morals wantingly or deliberately but it is something that refuses to acknowledge a moral system. Let me give you an example from Hobbes, though he's not a classical liberal, like I told you yesterday, he's a proto-liberal. Hobbes was asked to justice, define justice and uh, Hobbes's definition of justice
he says what all people or a majority of people call justice is what justice is so he says it is something that like every other word is derived out of a shared meanings of ah uh, of words in fact it is this particular statement that he made which uh, made uh, ludwig wittgenstein do an analysis of uh, hobbesian philosophy by looking at the language that hobbes used i won't talk about that now we'll talk about that in the other class when we do the other paper right so he says he asks this question very pointedly can you tell me a logical reason why a dog is called a dog okay he said by the use of logic can you establish by the use of logic can you establish that there is an intrinsic relationship between the sound dog language is sound nuanced sound right so he says is there an can you establish an intrinsic and logical connection between the sound dog and the animal dog he will also ask you is there some kind of a logic in calling a table a table and a chair a chair okay so he says is there a logical connection now obviously it is convention somehow a particular animal was designated a dog for all you know for all you know it could have been designated a cat and then everybody would call it a cat right that is the point that he is trying to say similarly with table do you have to say that this is a table is there some intrinsic relation between the table and the sound that denotes that as a table there isn't it's just pure convention again i'm sitting in front of a laptop it's a computer originally the term computer was given to all devices that computed you know what computed is okay computation is nothing but some kind of mathematics 
divisions, subtractions, multiplications. It all started with, with the idea that these devices will do complex things that other that the human being cannot do by himself. So that is how you look at a computer. That's how, because it does computation, it came to be called computer. Till then, yes, there is a logic. But today, when I'm using a computer, what computation am I doing? I don't do any computation. I am using it to load Zoom and talk to your people. Now even email has gone out of fashion. So except every once in a while sending an email. Okay. And in most instances, I don't do most instances, people play games. Is that a computational device? No, still call it a computer. So there is no logic behind calling these devices computers. Similarly, is this a phone? Is this a phone? The other day, my wife was laughing at me because I said, uh, I'll make a telephone call. She said, in which age are you? Telephones have long gone. I said, no, I'm sorry to say that uh, telephone, as long as you are able to speak over great distances, that phone, and especially these, which have no, uh, what should I say? These devices which have no wires connecting them to anything. They are really telephones if you're using them as a phone. It's like telepathy. Telepathy is without any physical connection your ability to read somebody's thoughts. That's telepathy. Telekinesis is your ability to move things without using any instrument to move that thing. Teleportation. If you go from one place to another without using any form of transport, that is teleportation. Among all these tellies, the only thing that worked was a telephone. But now we don't call this a telephone. In fact, should we even be calling it a phone because nobody talks these days everybody texts everybody is sending text messages right and now that whatsapp is free or if the government of india doesn't uh, agree to WhatsApp's privacy policy. We may move on to another platform. Signal is waiting for this to happen. Just imagine what size of a market it will get. Okay. The second biggest cellular telephony market is what it will get access to. So the signal is waiting hoping that the government will kick WhatsApp out. Nobody sends an SMS because it costs money. Now text. 
right so should we be calling it a phone and most of the time people are taking pictures and every time a new iphone or a new samsung galaxy phone or any of these are launched they are advertising the cameras how many pixels in what kind of light it can take pic pictures and they are used to play games so are they phones they are not but we call them phones so that is arbitrary so hobbs is saying the same thing convention will say so and so means x or y or z so what people believe or a majority of people believe is justice conventionally is justice so he says there's no other definition i can give you okay if a maximum number of people in society believe that rape is justice then that is justice so in that sense you will find that liberalism is a moral though he is not really a, a liberal a full liberal but he is an individualist and a proto liberal and what does liberalism do liberalism promotes in this order capitalism individualism and accumulation of property this is what liberalism promotes so let's take the example of capitalism those of you who attended my evening class will remember that it is because of capitalism and the contradiction in it which is on the one hand it says you should encourage competition but on the other hand it is actually trying to restrict when competition becomes too much so it wants to expand the market but it wants to restrict competition so that is the thing that you find in capitalism okay now can capitalism be a moral system that is the question capitalism is not a moral system because what does capitalism prioritize over every thing else it prioritizes profits and monetary gain and not losing money over any other consideration so capitalism is not in any way moral there's nothing moral about capitalism it is at its best a moral and at its worst it is immoral 
I told you the story of America, Capitol, that building, C I P I C A P I T O L, that has lobbies in between the uh, Congress, the President's office, or the Governor's office, and uh, the judiciary. There are lobbies. And people who have access to these lobbies, people who have access to these lobbies are those people who basically, who basically believe, okay, that they can get a job done. Now, let me tell you something. When I came into contact with somebody who had COVID, the first time I booked a test at home, because I went into isolation, uh, I booked a test at home through Apollo Hospitals who have tied up with uh, Tenet Labs, they sent a person to do the uh, RT-PCR test. Now, that person came, he did the test. I got my result. And then I had to get a second negative after the passage of some more time. And this time around, the COVID wave, second wave, was really rising, it was beginning to rise. So somehow that chap from uh, Tenet Labs had called me to ask me directions to my house when he came the first time. So the second time when we, when I approached Apollo Hospital and said I'd like to book uh, an appointment for a RT-PCR test, they said we are not doing it anymore. But we, is they gave me names of two or three labs and they said we recognize tests only from these labs. So I call that Tenet Lab Fellow, who put me onto his boss. And I needed that test if I had to get out of quarantine. Quarantine. I had been in quarantine already 16 days. I had been in quarantine. And I was told that after you get uh, a second negative, you have to be in quarantine for five more days because you've come in touch with a family which had all of them getting COVID. So I was a bit desperate. So I called this guy and said, what? He said, listen, I don't know, we're running out of kits. And then I did what I thought I would never do. Really. And since then, my opinion of myself has gone below way, way below the ground. I asked him, if I pay a premium, will you do this test for me? And the chap said, yes. For him, he is getting more money because I'm paying a premium. Already the rates had been put up. 
And I am willing to pay a premium over that. And he's happy with that. Lo and behold, in two hours, somebody comes, takes my sample. They originally said 48 hours. And because I had paid a substantial premium, I got the result in 18 hours. That is capitalism. It doesn't recognize morality. It has this, I told you, the usage of pragmatism. Pragmatism is opportunism. Okay, it is compromise for the sake of reaching your goals. It's a compromise. All these, in the times of COVID, look at what's happening with capitalism. As hospitals are running short of beds, boutique hotels which didn't have a flourishing business and some big hotels have made parts of their hotels as COVID hospitals. They have set up isolation wards. They have set up oxygen. They have set up ventilators. And they charge money. And they charge money. Every day I get a call from somebody or the other saying, do you know anyone who will sell Remdesivir? Do you know somebody who will, there is some medicine against this new thing that has come up, black fungus. Do you know somebody in uh, uh, the pharmaceutical industry from whom we can get this? Now they are trying to save their dear ones. So they are taking recourse to these desperate measures. They are willing to pay because they have money. They're willing to pay more. Something that costs 1,500 is being sold for 40, 50,000 in the black market. And I said, no, I don't have contacts. I really don't. And I thank God for it, because if I had contacts, then it would have become a moral dilemma. This is a friend who is asking, do I sacrifice the friend to morality? And having been immoral myself, I was not dying. I was not dying. I just wanted to get out of quarantine as quickly as possible. So I needed that second test done. So I paid money. So I'm a hypocrite if I say that I believe in morality. So I thank God for putting me in this position where I cannot help anyone, either with hospital beds or with ventilators, or with medicines, both for COVID and for the black fungus, in, in, uh, which is mucor uh, uh, mycosis. So I'm glad if I was in a position where I could do something, then I would have become an even more horrible human being than I have already become. I have become horrible. I'm confessing this in public. 
I could have waited. It meant a few more days. But no, I wanted to get out. Because it was proposing all kinds of logistical problems at home. So capitalism at best is amoral and at worst it is immoral. It does not have morality. So liberalism is not a philosophy of morality. It is not something that promotes the moral component of life. Individualism. When you say that you place individual prior to everyone else, it looks like we are talking about uh, some individual, a third person. That's what we think we are talking about. But when we are talking about individualism, we are talking about ourselves. We put ourselves before anyone else. We put ourselves before anyone else. Okay. I love that uh, article that was published in Times of India. Okay. And uh, this was about, again, COVID. And that author says in that article, if you have traveled by plane, remember what the air hostesses and the stewards do, the drill that they do while the plane is taxiing for takeoff. They talk about oxygen masks. And what do you do? They tell you, please don't use it on a child first. If you're carrying a young child who doesn't know how to use that oxygen mask, put it on yourself first. Then you'll be in a position to help the other. So first preserve yourself so that you can help others preserve themselves. So he says that is the approach we should take. Let us first take care of ourselves and then worry about how to take care of others. That is for me the ultimate in pragmatism. Take care of yourself first and take care of others. So you come first. Individualism is not just some unknown person coming first. It is you, in this case, me coming before anybody else. I will look after my good and if after that, if after that I have some money or some time, then I will spare it to do social good. I give to charities. There's a deduction from my credit cards every month. I give to save the children, to cry, to help age. And 
I also donate to that Sadhana Institute for the Mentally uh, Handicapped Children and Old People because they don't get uh, government grants. Government doesn't recognize mental illnesses. Government only recognize physical illnesses. And even if you take a, a mediclaim policy, it very clearly says that mental and dental illnesses are not covered in this. Very clearly says that. So I thought I was being a social do-gooder. I'm donating to these charities. I'm doing this thing of... And I gave away my parents' whole household articles. I have emptied it completely. And then I thought, let me help the rural students who come. Let me help those people with remedial education and if they require whatever they require. So, I thought I was trying to be a nice person, a good person, not an individualist. But this one act, this one act, where I paid a premium and jumped the queue, has undone everything else that I have done. I don't know if those acts were good, but they weren't bad. But this definitely was bad. Very bad. So, you put yourself ahead of everyone else. That's what in liberalism promotes. And you want property. The wonderful thing about property is there's no end to how much you want. Hmm? Afrin Begum, what is your favorite dish? What do you like to eat most? Your favorite curry? Fish curry, sir. You like to eat it with rice or roti? Both, sir. Along with fish, uh, rice and roti. So, if I put a huge cauldron, huh? this big, the thing that where people cook for marriages, for many people, if I come and put that in front of you as fish curry, and if I put some 10,000 rotis in front of you, just because you like that, will you be able to eat them all? No, sir, it's not possible. Hmm. So with other needs, we stop when we are full. That's nature. If you see, if a predator kills an animal, a predator like a lion or a tiger, after it kills a herbivore, the herbivores are no longer afraid of the lion. They are afraid of it while they know it is hunting. Once they have seen that kill happen and the tiger or an entire pride of lions feeding on the kill, they are a few feet away. Why? Because they know now that they won't kill. They can't eat. Why will they kill? So, 
there is no greed when it comes to things like satiation of hunger somebody might like ice cream a lot but you can't sit and eat dozens of cones of ice cream or cups of ice cream there's a limit but with property no limit chief minister raj shekhar reddy chief minister of the then undivided andhra pradesh when he died his net worth was estimated to be 1600 plus crores one man one family and so lord jagan constructed whatever he did near the lotus pond hmm mukesh ambani lives in 24 floors what what is he doing in those 24 floors seriously and we are so desperate to see who's the richest man this year is it jeff bezos is it uh, mark zuckerberg is it bill gates bill gates is no longer bill gates is out over and done with half his fortune has been taken away by melinda she has taken half of it so he is not uh, going to be in the top 3 or 4 but we are very very curious about this who has how much money what is their net worth and jeff bezos who can sustain an african country with his wealth when there was a lockdown in the united states he refused to pay the workers of amazon because he said you're not doing any work why should i pay you for it being the richest man in the world this is what he said mark zuckerberg didn't pay half his stuff he asked him to leave not because he had a dearth of money but because he wanted to cling to that money didn't want that to get lessened without returns on that investment roi return on investment that is what so liberalism promotes these things it promotes these things and in doing so it is something that becomes immoral at its best and completely immoral i will never buy anything if i can from reliance it's a company of thugs it's a company of thugs and prime minister modi has inaugurated a phase in indian history where we now have out in the open a particular phenomenon called k 
crony capitalism. Does anyone know what it means? Anyone? Are you is are people there? We are here, yes, sir. Yeah. So has anyone heard of crony capitalism? Mr. Akshay, are you there? Yes, sir. Have you heard of crony capitalism? Yes, sir. So please tell me what it is. Industrialists who are manipulating government, they are called crony capitalists. Manipulating how? Their policies, policies of government. No, they are not. For their profits. For their profits. That's what every capitalist does. That's what every capitalist does. That's why the lobbying system came in. Crony capitalism. What does the word crony mean? In simple English. Chronic disease. No, Chronic no. means continue. Huh? No, no, that's C H R O N I C. You're talking about chronic. I'm talking about crony. Yeah. C R O N Y. What does it mean in English? Okay. In simple, straightforward English, what does that mean? A friend. Right. A friend is a crony. In its most innocent usage, that is what you will say. A friend is a crony. But cronies are people who do things together. Friends who do things together. Whatever it may be. Going and eating breakfast every day. You go together and do it. Okay. You can go and watch movies every movie you go you go with your friend so people who do things together as friends are called cronies crony capitalism is when the government favors the friends of those in power. So Gautam Adani, Mukesh Ambani, and uh, uh, Anil Ambani are all friends of Narendra Modi. They are the reason why he has risen in the ranks of the BJP to become the Prime Minister of the country. Ahead of other well-established leaders who had more of a pan-India image But Modi was promoted ahead of all those people because these people supported him. Why did they support him? Not because they are Gujaratis and he is Gujarati. No. That is one reason. But that's not a reason that we should take into consideration. If you favor him, Ajay Singh. Have you heard of him? Anyone? Ajit Singh, sir. No, Ajit no. Singh. A A Ajay Singh. Ajit no, Singh sir. is uh, Charan Singh's son who passed away recently. Ajay Singh was the original promoter of the Spice Group. Okay. The Spice Group entered the telecom sector. 
there, there were once a competition to Airtel and all those. He was the promoter of manufacturing of cellular, 2G cellular phones under the Spice brand. And he is the man behind Spice Jet. Okay. At one time, there were about 12 different players, 12 different players who offered telephony, uh, inter, sorry, cellular telephony services. Now, how many do you have? Does anyone know how many cellular telephony providers are there in India now? Two or three. 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 The rest have all been wiped out. How? Thanks. Because of Geo. Hmm. And what, how could Geo wipe the others out? They made a regulation, a policy that a network that is newly set up can provide free voice calls to people who are a, who become a part of that cellular network but they will take money for data that is what the policy was and they gave them 18 months in 18 months geo said free calls Anywhere, whichever network you want to call, call. Want to call abroad? Please do so. Free. Free. And when 18 months was happening, they asked for an extension. Now, that required an amendment. And so they couldn't do it. So what did they do? They tried to abolish what are called inter-user charges. Okay. Inter-user charges is that if I use Airtel and I call Vodafone. Okay. Somebody who has Vodafone. Then I pay a certain amount of money to certain amount of the money that I earn from my subscriber who made that call. If the call lasted 10 minutes and the tariff came to, uh, let's say 10 rupees, then you will give one fourth of it. One fourth of it you will give to the other network you will give to Vodafone. Similarly, if somebody called from Vodafone to Airtel, the same thing will happen. Now, Reliance basically wanted to get rid of this inter-user charges. That didn't happen. So they did the next best thing. What was the next best thing? The next best thing was make sure, make sure that you minimize the inter-user user charges. So 
I used to get telephone bills of 7,000, 8,000. And suddenly they fell to 2,000. And I was wondering, how did this happen? That's when I did some research and I found out this is how it happened. And Geo said, we will not even take inter-user charges. So more people went. Act Fibernet has been trying to get a permit to give internet at one GBPS and more speed. Okay, but the government is not letting them go beyond 400 Mbps. Hathaway is stuck at 100 Mbps. They're not getting permission to increase. This is crony capitalism. Anil Ambani lands up in all kinds of financial problems. He's bankrupt, unlike his brother, who's very intelligent. This guy is a dud, apparently. So what does his brother do? He lobbies on his behalf. And the Rafale aircrafts, are supposed to be manufactured in India after buying that 36. Originally, we were supposed to buy 126 Rafales because our Air Force requires 42 squadrons of aircraft and we have only 30. And in that 30, most of them are vintage. MiG-21s, MiG-29s. Except for the Sukhoi Mark II. So, Dosso, D-A-S-S-A-U-L-T, Dosso Aviation, which is supposed to be the manufacturer of Rafale, has been given a tie-up with Anil Ambani's reliance, ADAG. Okay, that's his group. Anil Dhirubhai Ambani group. They have got the permission to make these aircraft. Now, in the written word, there is a technology transfer. But in actuality, they are not transferring any technology. They are manufacturing. Dasso Aviation is manufacturing some aircraft here for which they will pay Anil Ambani a certain amount of money so that he need not go to jail. That's crony capitalism. Adani has been given 151 greenfield airports. He has been given 151 greenfield airports to develop them. Okay, GVK group that had developed the second terminal and was supposed to develop the third terminal in the Mumbai airport. Their contract was terminated and given to Adani. And Adani is working very hard to take away the GMR airport here in Hyderabad from the GMR group. 
but the GMR group is an international group, so they are resisting. But they gave counter bids for those 151 airports and none of them was allowed. They all went to Adani. GMR didn't even get a token to three airports. Now there's a proposal to give the Hindustan shipyard, which is there in Vizag and dysfunctional. So they want to give it to him free of cost to Gautam Adani because he's also into developing shipping, harbors, shipbuilding. So they want to give it to him. He'll get it free of cost because it's a non-performing asset. So that is crony capitalism. And that is why Gandhi said, while talking about capitalism, he said there is enough in this world for every man's need, but not for every man's greed. And I'm shocked and surprised to see the young generation who look up to these figures who are trillionaires in rupee terms, billionaires in dollar terms. You look up to them. That is what liberalism does. That is liberalism. And that is how it functions. It has no... In liberalism, I'll leave you with this comment. In the vocabulary of liberalism, till John Rawls came onto the scene, there was no usage of the word justice. A proto-liberal gave that definition and after that people decided there's no need to uh, give any definitions of what justice is. That's what they decided. Justice doesn't figure. And as crony capitalism is growing, not just in India, mind you, this is not a uh, thing that is happening only in India. It's happening everywhere in the world. Social movements have started because of crony capitalism. Social movements, not political movements. Social movements have started everywhere in the world. And that is the reason why the term civil society has come back into use. But its meaning is now different. For the liberals, especially John Locke, the civil society is that which is consisting of the propertied class of people and who have been given the rights and who have been given the power to enter into a social contract with the sovereign and remove him if they don't like him. That meaning of civil society, which if I'll discuss that while doing uh, log, social movement started. In India, social justice movements started because we have an additional burden which is the caste system. 
because I told you the caste system continues to exist, not as it did at one time. Now it's become a political variable. The caste system went through, I mean, the idea of Varna went through sublation and became Jati. Then it went through sublation again, Jati, and it has become the Portuguese word caste. Otherwise, neither Varna nor Jati are the equivalents of the caste. But that I shall leave for another day. So social justice movements also have become, and today these are called civil society. Now, Rawls is the first philosopher within the ranks of liberalism to talk about justice and the redistribution of what he called primary social goods. Otherwise, liberalism does not recognize the word distribution. The Marxian notion of justice is distributive justice. Equalitarian distribution of social wealth. And you should also understand that Marxism has justice in it, but liberalism never had. So, Rawls talks about not distribution, but redistribution. And he's not talking about wealth, but he's talking about what he calls primary social goods. That I shall leave for tomorrow. We'll start with Rawls and his thing tomorrow. Any questions? Are you all alive or have yes, sir. Yes, sir. six people? Okay. All right. Any questions? No, sir. Uh, Akshay. Sir, how do you define liberalism in a simple language? Yeah, liberalism uh, in simple language, it, it originally meant being tolerant to opposition. Okay. It meant being tolerant to opposition. It meant entertaining ideas that were unlike yours. It meant accepting your wrong if you are logically proved to be wrong. All those things it meant. But that was not what it ever was. It never was all those things. When I do lock, I'll tell you the liberal surmounting method. So even if you have, you, you are open to argument, but Locke very cleverly devised this method where he will logically demonstrate to you that your conclusions are not consistent with your premises. Okay, that's what he will do. But liberalism, please remember, is an open society. It's an open society in the sense that people can choose what they want to be. Unlike in the medieval period where you had the control of the church and the control of the feudal professional guilds. 
So in liberalism, you're a free individual. Okay, you're free to determine yourself. It will allow you to say, I am rational and I can think for myself as to what is good for me. It will allow you to say that. That is the original, the thing of liberalism. Having a liberal attitude is being open to new ideas, being tolerant to opposition, being tolerant to arguments, all those things it means. At some point in school, you might have asked your teachers when you wrote a test, please evaluate liberally. Huh? We used to ask because our teachers were unbelievably strict. So I used to say, teacher, please, can you be a little liberal? Okay, which means tolerate our deficiencies. That is how it is understood. It is supposed to be understood. And that is how people understood, but it doesn't work like that. Okay. Any other? All right, then. I assume that you're done. Yes, sir. Right. Oh, thank you very much. See you thank tomorrow. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah, see you tomorrow. Thank, Thank you. you. Right. And I hope to see some of you in the evening because I'm doing that positivism fact value dichotomy, which you need to know. All right. Thank you. <laughs>